to manage these pressures down. The, the dispute that's currently underway in the railways needs to be seen as part of that. We need to see the productivity reformed, which will make the railway better for the future, and we need to see a realistic expectation around pay, which doesn't entrench. That's uh, for Grant Shapps, the Transport Secretary. And uh, we're going, it's an interesting day today because tomorrow uh, we're going to see the first big strike by the railway workers. And uh, having and been, having been the dentist who led the dentist into a strike, I've got a sort of a, a bit of a unique perspective on this. Um, mainly because I've sort of got a bit of, a little bit of uh, more than average knowledge of how these things work. And uh, at the moment you've got inflation is uh, basically eight, nine, 10, forecast 11%. And um, because of basically, because of all the money that's printed, this massive expansion in the money, inflation in the money supply, M2, and so that's finally uh, finding its way, having found its way through into the property market and the stock exchange first, and then the property market, and then uh, commodities, it's now finding its way through to consumer prices. So, of course, uh, the public are faced with a uh, situation where they're all being told that they're going to get a 3% increase in their pay. For example, pensioners might, I have an NHS pension, I've been told I'm going to get 3.1% and yet the news is telling me that the price is going to go up 10 or 11%. Now the first union, or it used to be I suppose the National Union of Mine Workers under Arthur Scargill, but uh, now uh, it's the railway workers and uh, what they're doing is they're going to try and exert some muscle to uh, get themselves a, a pay rise which is in line with uh, inflation. In other words, to, to prevent their standards of living de deteriorating. And uh, you know, you really can't blame them for that. The uh, problem is that uh, the government uh, and has for thousands of years worked in the way that they run deficit budgets and uh, can't uh, tax the people enough to pay for their spending and so what they do is they um, debase the currency by printing more of it which then uh, causes consumer price inflation which and they then have to um, try and make sure that prices that the wages don't catch up with prices because that's the way that they, the whole thing resets itself by a massive reduction in the living standards of effectively the middle class because the rich, the very rich have ways of avoiding these things and the poor have got no money anyway so it's the middle class who ends up paying. So uh, and it's ent entirely uh, forecast uh, years in advance by people like Peter Schiff although uh, he's completely wrong about cryptocurrency, but he's got a very good model of the general economy. And, um, let me just plug the power in. And uh, Grant Shapps is saying, you know, well, we're technically, we're not the employers, the government is not the, the rail companies are the employers, and uh, it's up to them, the employers and the employees. Uh, however, that's not, how it works, what happens is the government tells the employers what they can pay and therefore they are an unseen hand in these negotiations which are going on today to try and prevent the strike. Well, there, there's two problems with that. One is that, you know, it's, you can't negotiate between two parties, one of which is a proxy for the government and that's what we found when we were negotiating with our pay, I mean, we negotiate. The, the government's very proud of the uh, independent pay, you know, and they make a point of mentioning every time there's an independent pay review body and that they always abide by their recommendations. But of course, they don't. It's not, and they don't. You know, they uh, they are told pretty much what the you know is expected of them in terms of pay awards, and um, they apply it across the board. And uh, the government then has the final veto so if they award too much then they can veto the pay award which they do uh, have done in the past just completely vetoed it and dissolved the 
the pay review committee and uh, all the other thing they do is the uh, pay review body says let's say you know like, we think you should get five percent but public finances are not so good at the moment so we're going to give you three and then they send it to the government and the government says well uh, the pay review body said that you should get three but the part the old finance is not so good at the moment so we're going to knock that down to one and a half you know so you're in double jeopardy because you get penalized twice They're because both bodies take into account something which they they shouldn't the pay review body thinks it's uh its job to reduce the on, on the grounds of economic matters and then the government sees that as their purview so the whole thing gets done twice so it really is you know you are you do get shafted on pay in this country but the government is the problem with the government is that it, it literally wants uh, almost always it wants these uh, negotiations to fall through because they it's got a plan B and in fact their plan B is actually their plan A which is to you know do, do all sorts of things and muck about in all sorts of ways to try and uh, break the strike and undermine the uh, earning power of people in you know by I mean directly by you know all sorts of all sorts of dirty tricks uh, by you know planting stories in the press uh, making sure that you're not notified of government meetings or, or press conferences and stuff like this banning you from government press conferences your your uh, your media and uh, yeah and uh, I mean you know bugging your phones as well and all sorts of stuff so uh, I am, you know, I mean, I don't know whether you're pro-union or anti-union. I mean, I, I was just, I was the cha chairman and general secretary of a, of a trade union, a very, very tiny trade union for a long time. So, I mean, but I, so I could say that I am in favour of, um, I'm in, all I can say is I'm in favour of a person's right to withdraw their labour. I think that you should have, and ultimately we are not slaves and therefore we ultimately uh, at our own expense and at our own risk, uh, our own jeopardy, I think we have a right to withdraw our labour and uh, then after that what happens then is depends on who needs whom more, you know, do the employers need the employees or do the employees need the employers? But a lot of the uh, abuse um, um, and uh, you could argue, for example, that uh, in America, let's take an obvious example, a lot of uh, industry was lost in America because America was very highly unionized and especially in the steel in, uh, sectors and the car automotive sectors and um, as a result, you know, the American uh, manufacturing was very un... un competitive and so they lost out to Japan and the Far East so there are downsides of unionism when uh, they do find that they've got a lot of bargaining power or rather when they're competing against uh, industries that aren't unionized where, where they have very little bargaining power and they basically just uh, you know, get a bowl of cornflakes a day and a place to sleep So, <coughs> I've just given my staff a, a sort of a fairly hefty pay rise because um, we're, I'm, I'm out of that now, you know, I don't have to go through the pay review body to be told what to get paid and I don't have to go, uh, I'm not in the public sector and having to justify my wages. Uh, you know, and, and have to cope with all these silly arguments such as, oh well, the more that's spent on wages, the lesser is available for treatment. You know, that's not true. Um, the more motivated your workforce is, and the more efficient and organised, the more capital you invest in your surgery, the more work gets done, the more patients get treated. So, we're free to develop our own model, our own highly efficient model. Um, and as a result, you know, we are now very, very busy. And not just very busy handing out antibiotics, which is what the NHS dentistry is still doing. We're, we're very busy doing work. 
crowns, bridges, dentures, fillings, stuff like that, you know. And and getting patients ring up saying, do you do NHS? No. Or they, they used to say that, they don't really say that anymore. They just say, I've got a toothache, can you see me today? So we say, yeah. 45 quid plus the antibiotics. So, plus our chance, c'est la même chose. We, the uh, whole thing's going round in circles again. It's 30 years ago, I think, since the dentist went on strike. It's 92, I think, 93, 94, I forget. But, you know, we, on the one side, I always said that, you know, you, you, you'll get everything right the second time. Yeah. Second time you lose your virginity, second time your parents die, second time you lead a national strike. That's that's when you've done it once already, so you know what's the best way to do it the second time. First time you muck it up, second time you do it properly. And I think uh, to a certain extent, I'm rather hoping that the uh, union has got the experience to be able to find their way through this. but. The government is a disingenuous one, that's my point. The government is not, you know, they're like Grant Shapps saying, well, the BBC said, shouldn't you be at the negotiating table? And he said, well, you know, it wouldn't do any good to have a third party at the negotiating table. And that's the whole point of the question was that they're not a third party, they're the second party. They are the second party. It's the unions and the government. And they're going head to head and the employers are just the proxy for it. And uh, I don't envy ACAS, the Advisory Conciliation and Arbitration Service, which is by law you have to go through before you can go on strike, because they know, and they know that they're not stupid either. I mean, they know that uh, they go along with the gag that the uh, that the employers have got the authority. It's the first rule. Richard Denny's first rule of salesmanship is talk to the person who's got the authority to make the decision. If you're talking to someone, like I suppose you're trying to sell advertising or a crown or anything, uh, you, you know, and they say, oh, I don't know. And you say, well, look, can I just check? Have you got the authority to make this decision? And they might say, no, I need to run it past my boss. And, then, and so you say, well, in that case, I'm talking to the wrong person, aren't I? I need to talk to your boss. I need to talk to the person who can agree. Why, why am I trying to get you to agree if it doesn't mean anything? And it, and it actually works in reverse as well, because supposing somebody's trying to sell you something, I don't know, anything, just say a car or something, um, and you're, you know, you don't really want it or you want some time to think about it, then, um, then you say, look, I need to, um, uh, what I'll do is I'll take this away and I'll run this past my wife. Now, if they've read Richard Denny's book, then they'll say, oh, well, I'm, I'm not talking to, have you not got the authority to make this decision? And you say, no, well, I would, I need to, you know, my wife and I make decisions jointly. And they say, well, look, let's, why don't we get you and your wife together one day and then I'll, we can have a chat, the three of us. But they don't, they all say, oh, well, uh, okay then, okay then. Let me know when you've had a chat with her and then you can just ring back and say, no, we've decided, you know, jointly. And they never talk to the wife, they never see the wife, the wife never, may never exist. <coughs> <coughs> so, <coughs> anyway, we're going to have a lot of rail disruption. And uh, they interview a lot of commuters saying that, you know, how uh, annoying it is. The commuters at this stage, they don't say how disgusting it is and how the railway men are paid a, lot, a good screw, you know, and uh, why uh, they're, and that they're victimising the commuters. At this point, they don't. They just get a lot of people in to say, oh, I'm due to travel to London this week, oh, the, uh, but I've had to go by air, which is less eco-friendly, but I've had to do it. Or, or another woman who said, oh, I'll, I'll go down the train station and I suppose I'll, I'll just have to see if there is a train is there, you know, in order to get to get to work. They don't uh, interview anybody like me who says, you know, these people have got a right to withdraw their labour, and that um, I don't see why they should have to make a take a massive great cut in their standard of living um, to uh, 
to you know because the uh, governments um, inflated the money supply and decimated their savings and their wages. But um, you know that's uh, the thing is the government. I mean the 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 unions can't even make it just about the pay. If they could just say, look, it's a very simple. We're getting off for three percent. Inflation's ten percent. That we just wanted to make up the seven percent. That's all it's about. That's the only issue. But the government won't allow that. They don't say what they what they do is they say, okay, look, now for even to give you your three percent, we're going to insist that you make massive changes to your terms and conditions. Number of drivers on the trains, guards on the trains, ticket inspectors on the trains, ticket uh, sellers on the platforms, blah blah blah. And so they compound the issue up, you know. And then so that they can say that the um, that the strikers in general are being uh, well when they when they refuse all of these uh, compound demands they say oh they're being unreasonable. Anyway, that's the uh, there's the scuttlebutt on that. Um, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.